Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. I want to kick this video off discussing a very interesting interview that WCCF Tech have had with 4A Games, and it concerns a lot of things, actually. RTX 3000 series and its very impressive ray tracing performance, the performance of the next generation consoles, not only in relation to the PC, but against one another, and, well, just a whole host of other things too. I won't go over all of the interview because it's quite lengthy and honestly it would be unfair to WCCF Tech if I just parroted everything, but I did want to give my thoughts on several uh, interesting things. And I also want to begin by giving some context. So Metro Exodus is not a new game, and obviously it does support a hardware-based ray tracing, DLSS already on the PC variant. However, there's going to be an enhanced edition which is going to release uh, for the next generation console, so that's Xbox Series X and S, as well as the PlayStation 5, and of course, the PC also benefits from this enhanced edition. There's kind of like a checklist of what has changed between the two variants, and I'm not going to read out everything here, but really a lot of it does come down to ray tracing. So, for example, at the very top there, full ray traced lighting throughout. Every light source is now ray traced. And yeah, the main difference between the PC port and the Xbox Series X and uh, PlayStation port is that um, the PC variant receives advanced ray traced reflections, more on that in a moment, and of course the PC variant also supports DLSS 2.0, given obviously DLSS is a proprietary NVIDIA technology, that doesn't really surprise too much. You'll also notice that um, they are kind of simplifying things here with the checklist. For example, they're stating that uh, both consoles are using DirectX 12 Ultimate support, including DXR and variable rate shading, which obviously isn't really accurate for the PlayStation 5 because the PS5 does not use DirectX at all. It uses its own APIs. Anyway, on to the questions. With regards to ray tracing specifically, how would you characterize the different capabilities of the PlayStation 5 and the Series X and both consoles from the new released RTX 3000 series? The response was, well, what I can say for sure is that the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X currently run our code at about the same level of performance and resolution. As for the NV3000 series, it's not comparable. They are in a different league in regards to ray tracing performance. AMD's hybrid ray tracing approach is inherently different in capability, particularly for divergent rays. On the plus side, it is more flexible, and there are a myriad, probably not discovered yet, approaches to tailor it to specific needs, which is always a good thing for consoles and ultimately console gamers. At 4A, we already do custom traversal, ray caching, and use direct access BLAs, uh, leaf triangles, which would not be possible on the PC. As for future games, the answer is yes, not only for graphics, by the way, why not path trace sound, for example, or AI vision, or some uh, explosion propagation? We're already working on some of that. So there's actually a lot to dissect here, and I am actually working on a more in-depth ray tracing video, and I'm probably going to go into that, well, a lot, uh, well, into this, excuse me, a lot more in those uh, subsequent videos. But yeah, um, this actually makes a ton of sense. I was recently interviewing uh, Neil Trevitt uh, in regards to the Kronos Group, and he and I were talking a lot about the possibilities for hardware-based ray tracing, specifically when it comes to things like um, ray traced audio. A lot of folks assume that ray tracing is just for you know reflective puddles or whatever, but the reality is that the technology is very malleable, and you can do a hell of a lot with it, including ray traced audio or, yeah, AI. And I personally think that uh, we're really at the, just the tip of the iceberg of what ray tracing can really bring to the, the forefront in uh, video games. I think it's going to be absolutely awesome. Furthermore, in regards to RDNA 2 being more flexible, uh, yeah, this again goes back to a previous leak of mine when I was first detailing kind of the desktop side of things of RDNA 2. And to my knowledge, Back then, Ampere was considerably faster than RDNA 2 for ray tracing performance, but the RDNA 2 architecture is very malleable and very flexible in its design. As we've seen previously, NVIDIA have ray tracing units on their GPUs which are very different to how uh, AMD employ them for RDNA 2, and this of course is the same for the consoles as well. Basically, the TMUs of the GPU are utilized 
for accelerating ray traversal. So what about the Xbox Series S? Um, there was a question of, there's been much talk in the game development community about the potential downside of having to support the lower spec Xbox Series S, particularly for its limited RAM. Do you foresee having any issues because of this? The RAM is not currently an issue for us, but GPU performance presents a challenge for future titles. Our current renderer is designed for high spatial and temporal resolutions, read 4K at 60fps. Dropping any of these would require us to do extensive calculation, dropping performance even further. We have a compromised solution right now, but I'm not satisfied with it yet. And yeah, I think when it comes to the Xbox Series S, um, I've mentioned this numerous times in the past, so I'm going to go over this fairly briefly, that the Series S I think is a real win for gamers in terms of getting them into the next generation relatively cheaply, but it is going to pre uh, present challenges for games developers. With that said, it's going to be highly dependent upon the engine. We've heard a couple of developers previously state that it's RAM that is the limitation for the Xbox Series S, and no, this developer is, well, saying it's not that, it's the GPU. So again, it's going to come down to the code, and I still maintain that we're way too early in the generation anyway to really get a handle on any of this. Might as well pick on the PlayStation 5 for a second. Similarly, when Sony announced the PS5 would feature variable frequency for the CPU and GPU, it raised eyebrows. How do you feel about this peculiar choice for the console? The answer was, I'm completely okay with it. Any engine workload is variable by nature, be it rendering or gameplay simulation. It's just another variable which we've already adapted to. By the way, we've lived with that for decades on the PC. End quote. If, by the way, you're unsure what they mean about the PC code, um, basically with modern day GPUs, the frequency can adjust on the fly depending on a host of different characteristics, heat, power consumption, for example. So as the GPU becomes hotter and hotter, its maximum frequency will adjust. However, it is always over the base frequency and typically will also go over the advertised boost frequency. So if the advertised boost frequency is 1750 megahertz, don't be surprised if your GPU hits like 1900 megahertz for sake of argument. And to be honest with you, it's kind of similar for CPUs as well. Ryzen has a very complicated boosting algorithm, and it does depend upon tons of different things, including but not limited to the workload which is being executed on the processor, the number of threads, temperature, power consumption, whether you kissed your computer and wished it good night the night before, and just tons of other things too. And really, I think that the PS5 and the boosting algorithm that's used actually makes a ton of sense. Ultimately, what it does is uses power to balance between the CPU and GPU frequency. And, you know, as Mark Cerny was stating in the Road to PS5 event, you know, typically speaking, the GPU does maintain the 2213 megahertz, but if there's very heavy CPU workloads, then that frequency can drop a little bit for a portion of a frame when we are talking about for just a couple of milliseconds here. Also note the recent PS5 die shot I find rather interesting and probably giving us a bit more context as obviously there was a small amount of the FFU which seemed to be removed, although we are judging from a die shot. And if you were to look at this as being true, and again, we are judging from a die shot, this is not official, and we're also doing a ton of guesswork based upon what we understand for, let's say, the desktop implementation of Zen 2. But assuming that it is accurate, typically the um, that aspect of a CPU is not exactly heavily used in most games. So at a guess, one of the reasons that Sony did this, removed it, is to reduce A, the size of the die. Admittedly, it's going to be a small, you know, it's, it's not really going to be a huge amount of die space, but it's still die space. And also to reduce uh, power consumption too, when obviously it's going to be so important for the CPU and the GPU to maintain higher frequencies. On the desktop, I'm actually playing around a lot with the uh, RDNA 2 or based RX 6800 XT. Uh, I'm going to be doing some tweaking guides on that after I've got my uh, mesh shading video up, uh, which is going to be in the next couple of days. Uh, with some tweaks and overclocking, I'm getting that uh, GPU, you know, kind of standard boosting behaviors around 2300, 2400 megahertz. And I can get the GPU getting way over 2700 megahertz, 
without too much difficulty, honestly. So RDNA 2 definitely does scale very well with high clock frequencies, but it also scales very well when it comes to wider designs. Another thing that I did want to discuss regarding the consoles comes to us through Anantech, and Dr. Ian Cutris has done a really good write-up of the Xbox Series X and the International Solid State Circuits Conference, or ISSCC, if you prefer. The presentation was Xbox Series X SOC, a next generation in gaming console, and it was a closed event. However, there were a ton of things disclosed here, and I'm not gonna go over Ian's entire article because again, A, that would be unfair to him, and B, the write-up is pretty lengthy. So I'll, of course, link his work in the video description. However, there are a couple of very interesting takeaways that I'd like to kind of discuss here for the Xbox. And I think it's actually a really good insight, um, the documentation that's provided into the challenges of designing a console. I'll also say that if you are interested more in more details of the Xbox Series X and my thoughts on the SOC, I've also covered this in a uh, hot chips kind of analysis, which I believe was uh, August, September, no, it's August, August last year. And uh, I went much more detail onto the GPU and so on. However, I'll be touching very briefly on some of this here. But if you are very interested in Xbox, I suggest you check out that video. But as a quick refresher, the Xbox Series X uh, SOC is also known as Project Scarlet. It's pretty damn big. It's 360.4, can't forget that 0.4 mm squared. So this is produced on TSMC's N N7 node and is also containing 56 compute units with 52 active for the GPU, more on that in a moment. And we also have eight CPU cores, 16 threads. The first slide at the ISSCC, which I find particularly interesting, is a comparison between the Xbox One X and Xbox Series X in terms of their socks. And you can see that the performance gains are actually pretty big, depending on what you're comparing against. The GPU is twice as powerful in terms of the Demlar T-flops, 70% additional memory bandwidth, and the CPU, in terms of relative performance anyway, is about three times greater. Microsoft are touting the system to have an improvement of 2.4 times performance per watt and twice the IO bandwidth as well. Side note, I'm not quite sure why it states 8 Hercules cores at 3.8 gigahertz. Uh, maybe I'm missing something there because Hercules is a line of ARM processors to my knowledge. So I'm not quite sure what's going on there because the CPU inside the Xbox Series X has been officially confirmed to be Zen 2, of course, by, you know, not only AMD, but Microsoft themselves like 2 billion times. So maybe I'm missing something really obvious. Either way, getting back to the uh, actual point, in terms of actual performance, of course, two times increase in GPU performance for TFLOPs is technically true, but with the caveat of it actually not being realistic. The reality is that the GPU is considerably more performant than that simply by virtue of, well, just being a way more efficient architecture. The Xbox One GPU is basically Polaris based, whereas this, of course, is based upon RDNA 2. So you do get rather considerable IPC leaps uh, for those generations of processors, as obviously you had uh, Polaris, Vega, RDNA 1, and now RDNA 2. And this also doesn't take into consideration technologies such as variable rate shading, mesh shaders, and anything else which can definitely help improve performance, although that is not quite TFLOPs, as we've discussed on the channel many times previously. The Xbox Series X has different operating modes for its SOC, in other words, different power uh, consumption figures, depending on what's going on. And yeah, the CPU has eight power states, the GPU has five power states, GDDR has three power states, and the internal fabric also has four power states. So for example, if you're playing video games, it's obviously using 100% of the console's power. If you're playing a game like an Xbox Series X title, and obviously that's going to consume a whole bunch of power. Whereas on the other hand, if you're just say watching a movie or something like that, then the sock is basically just being drip fed energy because it's not really doing a whole bunch of stuff. Meanwhile, if you are uh, having the system on background download duty, it's only gonna be about 8% of the sock power. The GPU is doing absolutely nothing and so on and so on, as you can see through this chart here. And it is worth noting that the 
memory on a console does actually start to eat up a lot of power when you have tons of different chips. So, of course, the bulk of the power consumption of a console is definitely the SOC itself. The CPU, the memory, and all of that jazz does eat a lot of power. But again, the GDDR6 memory modules are also not innocent here. If you've got 4, 8, 10, 12, whatever, depending on the device itself, it can start to add up really quickly because each of them is around two and a half watts it's drawing. So again, if you've got 10 of these, you times you know 2.5 by 10 and you've got like 25 watts right there. And the power supply in a console, um, it was of course revealed by uh, Austin originally that uh, the console for the pre-production samples anyway, it was like 320 watts for the PSU. You can imagine that the retail consoles are about the same internally. So there's going to be a bit of overhead there for the console itself. Naturally, you don't want the power supply to be on the very edge because components wear down over time. Furthermore, just because of the power efficiency of a, of a PSU, you want it to typically be at about 80% load, 90% load, depending on a plethora of different things. So that combined with the fact that the PSU also has to power other things, including, for example, uh, external hard drives that you plug in, charging uh, devices, and we can start to get a better understanding of, you know, these type of considerations for a console. The last thing I'd really like to tackle here for the Xbox, though, is the SOC and its compute flexibility. So I mentioned at the beginning of the whole section that the Xbox Series X has 52 compute units enabled. However, there are technically 56 enabled on the die, and this is, of course, for, uh, well, yield reasons. In the slide titled Xbox Series X SOC WGP Power Ratio, to hit 12 teflops, which was the goal early on for Microsoft for the Xbox Series X, you can see that, technically speaking, Running 52 compute units at 1825 uh, MHz was actually more expensive in terms of power consumption than running more compute units at a lower clock frequency, 1675. In fact, what we saw from the early GitHub leaks was that the system was running at 1600 and odd MHz, but uh, it did have 56 compute units enabled. But, you know, even as I was mentioning back then, I think that there was a very good chance Microsoft would want to tweak this and raise the clock frequency, because when you actually have higher clock frequencies, you get other benefits, such as the caches on the chip just running faster, and some workloads uh, just don't really scale well uh, across a wider interface. They can be better at faster clock frequencies. And when you also factor in the manufacturing uh, defects when you're creating a die, basically the larger the die is, the lower the yields are going to be as you want more and more components to work. And simply because the size of the Xbox Series X's GPU, there's a very good chance that if there is a defect, it's going to be one of these WGPs, simply by the fact that it's so there's so much space taken up on the uh, SOC by the GPU. And I think that Microsoft made a really good uh, bet there. I think that they kind of ended up with the best configuration possible for their system. Anyway, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. The normal stuff, if you have, like, share, comment, and subscribe. And thank you very much for checking out the video. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.